The hallucinogenic state, like the dreaming state, is a temporary disconnection from the physical body. The dreamer becomes a discarnate intelligence, traversing higher realms, no longer bound to the restrictions of time and the standard laws of physics. DMT is, you know, kind of a portal or, you know, kind of a door for the transport of the spirit out of the body, it, it appears to me. In some ways, the occurrence of DMT in our brains, in our bloodstream, is, is, is you know, kind of validation um, of a spiritual reality in quite a few ways. Could this strange chemical be offering us a window into events to come in the afterlife? The frequent appearance of helpers or assistants to ease us through the transition to other planes of existence suggests at least a strong parallel with funerary and afterlife traditions throughout history. The discovery of the unusual properties of the pineal gland illuminate the many strange references to this most mysterious part of the brain. In strange and unexpected ways, the temples demonstrated a special emphasis on the pineal gland and its role as the intermediary between mind and body, the seat of consciousness, and possibly the gateway into and out of life. The results suggested that the mysterious pineal gland may be linked to the mechanism through which we enter and leave our physical bodies. Could this have been the reason that the brain of the deceased pharaoh was removed? Was the pineal a kind of link or bridge or tether between the physical mummified body and the consciousness? From the very beginning of time, we see evidence of a science that described and somehow aided the transition of consciousness from a material existence to existence on a higher plane. It appears as though this science used as its training ground, the realm of dreams. The everyday act of dreaming may be a much more mysterious activity than most imagine. It may be a portent of things to come in the afterlife. The strange state of consciousness that one achieves during lucid dreaming might be the secret ability that opens doors in the afterlife. The dreams of a lazy or unstructured mind are diffuse, wandering. The dreamer is frequently not in control or in a state of passive viewership of the events in the dream. On the other hand, the dreams of a disciplined mind are lucid, meaning that a kind of continuous consciousness bestows upon one the ability to recognize the dream state and consciously act to control it. The lucid dreamer can in some cases exercise truly godlike powers in his dreams. This is the stuff that comprises the constant work performed by the initiates of the temple to harden and perfect this gem of attention, will and mental clarity. Latter-day rituals call for the ceremonial opening of doors. Are all these exercises training the subconscious to be continuous and proactive in the afterlife? It sounds like such a simple thing and um, Constance read it someplace and said, gee, uh, you can uh, you can trigger lucid dreaming by just all day long as you pass through a door touch it and go am i dreaming and it sounds so simple that you think oh this couldn't possibly work the first day i tried this i walked through a door and i'd remember oh okay i touched the, the the you know the side of the door and go am i dreaming and every time i did that i could feel my eyes focus a little bit differently you know and i sort of had to had to wake up and ask myself, yeah, am I dreaming? <laughs> and you do it a few times. And that night when you fall asleep, 
find yourself walking through a door and you go, am I dreaming? And all of a sudden you go, yes, I, I am dreaming, you know, and from then on, you, if, you, if you're uh, careful with it, you can, you can uh, continue on with your lucid dream. As the lucid dreamer becomes aware of his or her presence within a dream, the ability is suddenly bestowed to steer the dream, perhaps by suddenly becoming able to fly or levitate. When I was a kid, everybody dreams they fly, or at least I've talked to very few people that said that they've never dreamed that they've flown. Um, but I always had dreams that I was flying when I was a kid, and it would just be great. I was enjoying it, and I could tell I was really flying because I had this wonderful thrill in the pit of my stomach, and there was uh, the, the perspective, uh, you know, horizons changed, and and uh, the perspective of my view uh, was just perfect, as if I was flying in an airplane, the same, the same feeling. And then all of a sudden, I'd, I'd say to myself, well, I'm flying, how can I do this? And that little bit of doubt all of a sudden just made me just tumble like Icarus. And uh, everybody has th that experience, you know. I ask myself, well, how the devil am I flying? And then you lose your ability to fly. Well, s since I've grown a little older and have done stuff like touching doors and other crazy little things, uh, I can pop out pretty regularly if I if I'm uh, I'm not too tired and just want to go to sleep I can pop out uh, uh, pretty easily uh, and I can stay out and I can do it with just a little bit of a uh, little bit of concentration all uh, now all of a sudden I know don't doubt while you're flying by you know enjoy it you're out and stuff so it just took a little bit of concentration a little bit of, of um, uh, energy directed in a certain uh, in a certain way to keep me airborne in my dreams what might be happening during the death coma in those precious moments where people think you're dead you know but you know there's lots of stuff going on now what if you could keep your concentration going somehow directed it keep it going through uh, through the moments when most people allow themselves to dissolve they allow themselves to just go back into the energy matrix you know energy consciousness matrix or whatever it is I don't pretend to know but if there's a way to keep focused through one stage after another after another at least the book of the dead would indicate there's a goal that you can reach whereby you retain your individuality or at least your pure individuality and retain the consciousness of the continuity of your own existence and that might be the key to overcoming death. We see a very similar thing in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Only you've got a guy there actually saying, okay, okay, George, now you're going there. You're going to see one of these things, so watch out. And uh, so evolution seems to be a process of, of resistance to something and then overcoming that resistance and then being mutated by that struggle and then you move on. That seems to be how evolution works. Why shouldn't it work in consciousness also? Every initiatory society today, let's say the Masons, uh, everybody's dad or grandfather is a Mason, and they've all gone through this kind of thing. Um, it's no secret that, that in, in the initiatory process, you're stopped at a door. you got to really knock at the door of the temple, you know? And... Um, uh, you have to pass certain your question just like in the book of the dead your question and you have to come up with the right answer you don't get through